In last week's episode, we told you about the tragic story of Steven Steiner who became a hero at 14 years old. Steven managed to escape with Timothy White from their kidnapper who disguised as Steven's father after seven long years of putting up with him. Now, you might think nothing else could possibly go worse for the Steiners. The worst has already happened. Or so we thought. This family seemed to have opened Pandora's box because many years after Stephen died in the accident, the Steiners were once again completely caught by surprise. This is the second part of the two-part story about the Steiner family's worst nightmare. Carrie Steiner, Stephen's older brother, is on the death row guilty with four counts of first-degree murder. Also known as the Yosemite Killer, he mercilessly killed four women, two teenagers, one in her mid-twenties and a mother in her forties. And this is their horrifying story, viewer discretion is advised. Born on August 30, 1961, Carrie was only 11 years old when news of Stephen's disappearance broke out. The Steiners, being so preoccupied by the loss of Stephen, spent the next seven years tirelessly hoping to find Stephen alive. Their efforts did not go in vain when Stephen miraculously came back home in 1980. Delbert and Kay Steiner, their parents, moved mountains for Stephen, all at the expense of their four other children. The highest price? Carrie Steiner. Around the same time that Stephen died in the motorcycle accident, Carrie had already been living with his uncle Jesse. Apparently, it turned out that his uncle Jesse had been molesting Carrie and his cousin. It was also uncle Jesse with whom Carrie took illegal substance with. Tragedy did not spare uncle Jesse's life too. He was murdered in 1990 using his own gun just one year after Stephen died. The murder case remained unsolved, but report says that the culprit might have been a burglar. Meanwhile, Carrie continued to smoke weed and started to experience acute paranoia, but it did not stop him from smoking. Seven years later, he moved to El Portal after being hired as a maintenance guy at a local motel called Cedar Lodge, which was just near the Arch Rock entrance to the famous Yosemite National Park. While living off-grid in a cabin, Carrie spends his time in the woods and sunbathed naked. He also became deeply fascinated with Bigfoot, a mythical creature that lives in the forests of North America. He believes Bigfoot does exist, and he became passionately obsessed with finding Bigfoot. He has convinced himself that he will one day find the monster. Carrie got along well with his co-workers at Cedar Lodge, and has operated skillfully in his work. Until one night, there was a steady and persistent knock on the door of room 509 where 42-year-old Carol Sund, together with her daughter, 15-year-old Julie Sund, and her friend, 16-year-old Sylvina Piloso, were enjoying their vacation. It was scary knocking on their door, stating that there was a problem in the bathroom and that he needs to get in to fix it. It was already 11 o'clock at night, so Carol was cautious and did not open the door at first. She checked the bathroom and told Carrie on the other side of the door that she did not see any leaks or any problems. But Carrie was persistent and Carol's son made a fatal mistake of opening the door. As soon as he got in the door, he took out his gun and locked the two young girls in the bathroom. He then went to Carol and strangled her to death before dragging her into the trunk of the family's rented car. He went back to the room and assaulted the two girls. Then she killed Silvina Peloso after she started screaming and was not cooperating and took her body to the trunk of the rented car with Carol's body. Carrie went back in and sexually abused Julie for a few hours inside the hotel room. He then took Julie in the car and drove about 90 miles from Yosemite to Don Pedro Lake. He took Julie out of the car and brought her to another location and around sunrise, Carrie slit Julie's throat. He then called a cab to get back to Cedar Lodge and before he alighted, 
he asked the cab driver if she believes in Bigfoot. The cab driver quickly answered no. But Carrie then eerily replied, Well, you should. For Carrie and his fantasies, Bigfoot now transcends reality as Bigfoot is the real Carrie Steiner, his hidden dark side. His obsession with Bigfoot was his obsession with his own dark side which he tried so hard to control and resist, but now, this secret and evil personality has unfortunately come to light. A few days later, he went back to where he left the car and burned it to hide all the evidence. A man hunting in the woods later found bodies of two women in a car completely burned and unrecognizable. Then, the police obtained a handwritten map leading them to the location of the third woman's body. With the map was a note that read, We had fun with this one. The burnt bodies were later identified through forensic dentistry to be that of Carol Sand and Sylvina Peloso, while the third body was that of Julie Sand. During the investigation, Carey was one of those summoned by the police. However, due to his clear criminal record and his consistently calm disposition all throughout, he was able to dodge those scrutinizing eyes. Thinking he must have gotten away with it, in July 1999, just five months after Carey's first killings, another woman's beheaded body was found in a creek. It was that of a 26-year-old named Joey Ruth Armstrong, who was then working at the Yosemite Institute as a naturalist. She was getting ready for a trip to go hiking with her friends, and while she was packing her car, Carrie approached her and forced her inside the house and bound her. He then put her back to the car, but she was able to jump out of the car, but having been bound, she was not able to run away from him. Carrie tackled her, and he cut her throat. Witnesses have testified of spotting a blue 1979 International Scout parked outside Joey's cabin. The car was traced back to Kerry. Kerry was arrested late July after a woman at the nudist camp where he was hiding had reported him to the authorities upon knowing he was on the wanted list. After searching his car, the FBI found strong evidence implicating Kerry to the crime. During the interrogation, Kerry not only admitted to the murder of Joey but also took responsibility for the three women's murder earlier that year. He also admitted to sending the map and the note that paved the way for the police to retrieve Julie's body. Kerry pleaded not guilty by reason of insanity. His defense justified that the Steiner family's long history of mental disorder and sexual abuse caused him to have an obsessive compulsive disorder or OCD and ultimately led him to the commitment of the crime. A forensic psychiatrist designated by the court diagnosed Carey with mild autism, OCD, and paraphilia. Carey's childhood, even before Stephen got abducted, was not a walk in the park either. To his classmates, he has always been known as the creative one. You know, that season in life where people would always try to guess what you'd be when you grow up. People have always seen Carey to be a future cartoonist or graphic artist. Friends at Merced High and even his colleagues at Cedar Lodge would say he was an introvert, more like a loner, always doing his own thing. What people did not notice was the inner struggles Kerry had to battle with. He had a dark side hidden from everyone else. Since he was 7 years old, his fantasies were that of killing women. Some even said that he'd sometimes mention hearing voices. Although there were hints of this creepy secret, like the instance where he stripped naked in front of his sister's friends. People who know him could not really fathom that he would reach this point. A week before the murder of the three women, Kerry could no longer contain himself. He bought a rope, knife, camera, gun, and a duct tape, as if preparing the tool for the fulfillment of his hidden fantasies. This was not his first attempt though. He also admitted to almost killing his girlfriend and her two daughters just a year prior to the murders, but the victims were spared because of the presence of a male caretaker. In another attempt, there were four other young girls as his target, 
but his plan blew up when he knew an adult male was with them. In 2001, despite the plea for insanity, the jury found Kerry Steiner sane and charged him for four counts of first-degree murder and was sentenced to death on December 12, 2002. In California, Kerry was the 617th convict on death row and is currently in San Quentin Penitentiary. Making it to the headlines can be a possibility for any family, or any person for that matter. However, for one family to make it to the headlines twice for two different and contrasting instances is a whole new story. Many have perceived that Carrie Steiner's story was a product of envy, tired of being constantly on the sidelines. Maybe he wanted the spotlight on him too, but Stephen got all the attention from their family, from their community, the media, and the country. Maybe he wanted a taste of that publicity. Indeed, in the end, he got what he wanted, not as a hero, but as a serial killer. Even more astoundingly creepy, he told one of the first reporters who covered his case that Hollywood should create a movie of his story too. When Kerry was asked what his message was to the family he murdered, he said, I would like to tell the families that I am sorry that their loved ones were where they were when they were. It was as if he was trying to convince the reporter that he was a hero for restraining all these impulses and fantasies since he was a child. It is no question, there's this innate wickedness within all of us, just waiting to be uncovered. In Carrie's case, he became the Bigfoot that he was so madly obsessed about, the real monster living in the forest whom everyone must fear. If you have not seen part 1 of this story yet, you might want to click the link on the upper right corner to check out Steven Steiner's horrifying story. Thank you so much for making it this far. We would also greatly appreciate it if you hit the subscribe button and like our video as we are striving to reach a thousand subscribers. We are grateful for your support. Once again, thank you and we'll see you on the next one.